occupancy. The individual who has all lost his furniture, his automobile, and his house because he could not keep up his payments is a person confronted with an emergency, and we may be sorry for it. But he will continue to have emergency because it is in himself and not in the financing corporation. He has simply failed to be moderate. He has failed to be thoughtful. He has failed to let reason guide his conduct. Therefore, he is in trouble. And as Pythagoras even then pointed out, such men in such emergency curse the gods, failing utterly to see that it is their own mistake. By moderation also, we reduce pressures, and pressures release thought. And where pressures come down to a moderate level, the individual has greater mental leisure. He has greater opportunity to plan. The more emergency-filled his life is, the, least, the less energy he has for planning and purpose. And ultimately, he becomes totally absorbed in his desperate effort to adjust to the moment. He lives for the moment and dies in one of those moments. Thus, the, the disciplines of Pythagoras begin with a very practical situation, namely this placing of a good shepherd, a leader of souls, inside of each person. This shepherd that is kindly to the wayward sheep, and even kindly to the black sheep, the one faculty in us which does not like to get better. And we continue to wander, but the good shepherd and his kindly dog, which is philosophy, philosophy is the dog of wisdom, helps to bring back the sheep again and keeps them in the sheepfold, which is the right way and the right place and is security. Consequently, in all these things, man must become his own good shepherd, watching the flock of his emotions and desires and make his, making certain that the stray sheep does not fall victim to the wolf of avarice. If he is careful, thoughtful, and loving in these pursuits, he is already tempering himself, beginning to have the possibility of internal experience. For actually, when we put our outer life in order, we free our inner life. We give it an opportunity to do those things and be that thing which is right. Now, as we begin to overcome these weaknesses, we clarify values in terms of internal. We discover that the ways of the internal are more beneficial, more pleasant, more useful than the ways of the external. We realize that every part of ourselves, and in the, the golden verses, some emphasis is placed upon the body, that it is proper that man should regard the body as the instrument of his purpose, that he should be kind to it, guard it, take care of it, and preserve it by his own reason from any excess that will injure it. But if his own reason and his own emotions themselves are addicted to excess, then he works a terrible hardship on his body, bringing it down to ruin and bringing with it the ruin of his inner life. Thus the importance that man's leadership shall be complete, but always benevolent. Man is not the simple purpose which he wishes to achieve. He must then, according to the golden verses, Realize always that to the degree he grows, he becomes a paternal or maternal being. Growth is always in the direction of parenthood. Growth is never in the direction of autocracy. Now, many persons Im imply that parenthood is an autocracy, and that is one of the tragedies that has burdened homes for thousands of years. The belief that the parent is by divine right the master and proprietor of his family. This is not true. The parent by divine right is the good shepherd of his family. Always. 
He is the one to whom that family has a right to turn for protection and for understanding. The obedience given to the parent is given not to a person, but to the principles for which that parent may stand. And Socrates probably paid with his life for telling his disciple that a wise son should instruct his father and that the mere physical relationship of father to son does not permit the father who is ignorant to dominate the son who is wiser. But it is the natural desire of parenthood to lead, to lead constructively and benevolently. But parenthood is not limited to physical things, but it is an attitude, it is a concept. The moment an individual knows more, he is more patient. The person who knows more is best able to estimate the circumstances behind the weakness of others. And these circumstances, if understood, cannot lead to condemnation. We may advise, we may try to help, but it uh, speaks very clearly in the golden verses that the wiser person, the adjusted person, the discriminating person, is not presumed to lock himself in endless conflict with others. Nor is he to judge them, nor is he to condemn them. He is to understand them. And this is the blessed privilege, for as much as the parent is indulgent with the small child, knowing that that child must pass through certain experiences, so the wise scholar is indulgent with those less informed than himself, realizing that they are children, or less mature than himself, and therefore in need of his love and affection, and his intelligent guidance not in need of heartlessness, criticism, condemnation, or rebuke alone. Thus, by wisdom, we gain patience, and by patience, all good things become possible. There is no substitute for it. By wisdom also, we gain charity, and charity is not merely the sharing of goods. It comes from the Greek charitas, which means love. It is the individual giving of his own understanding, giving of what he is, not merely of what he has. All these points are made in the Golden Verses simply because they are part of the process that frees discrimination from the tyranny of sense. Now, most persons are much more interested in advanced studies. They want to go on to very involved doctrines. And here Pythagoras, perhaps of all the great teachers, uh, would not accompany them. He insisted that it was useless and valueless to attempt to develop special faculties of consciousness until the ordinary part of man was put in order. That we must build upon the firm foundation of achievement in small matters, that we must grow sequentially, and that we shall never discover anything that will cure our dispositional problem except our own effort. We can never intellectually advance far enough to get out of our human problem. The only way we can solve that problem is to meet it and correct it. The only way we can gain this liberation is through this retrospective process of studying ourselves. Now, very often, this kind of study has a drawback. And this drawback is more common to us because, as we have said, the modern world is rather different from antiquity in its attitude toward life. The Pythagorean disciplines belong to a way of life in which man had certain definite values, which are more or less absent in our contemporary pattern. Pythagoras lived in a world of people who were essentially simple people. He lived in a world in which man's religion 
was a very simple and naturalistic ritual. In those days, there was not much fear in religion, nor was there the pressure of confusion of sect and belief, which we know today. The Greek and Italian states had their native religion. Most persons followed it. Some attempted to interpret it, but a common faith held all men together. Also, there was a great and definite tendency to admire the philosophic life. Religion and philosophy led the public mind. Those who attained in these fields were regarded as the outstanding citizens. Thus the drift or trend was toward these matters, whereas today the drift and trend is not toward these matters. And the individual does not have the common strength of a natural, simple faith which was founded in the belief in good, and that things which were natural, fine, orderly, sequential, and kindly were good. Not having this common strength today, not having this simple foundation upon which to build, we have more confusion in our ways than perturbed the ancient. At the same time, we have greater opportunity, for the greater the problem, the greater the victory. One of the primary virtues is not to be exploited, but it is to attain this end by reason by judgment, by integrity. I believe there was a comedian here, W.C. Fields, some years ago, who pointed out that you cannot cheat an honest man. And it is very difficult. Because the honest man does not expect a bargain. And nearly all trouble begins when we try to get something for nothing. From that moment on, we are ready to be exploited because our own attitude is actually an open invitation to the dishonesty of others. And we will ultimately find someone who will take advantage of us. If, on the other hand, we expect nothing we do not earn, we have discrimination in matters of quality, we have foresight not to permit ourselves to become involved in situations we cannot control. And little by little, we have ordered our own lives. We are going to be very, very hard to cheat. The individual who, forgetting himself, bestows his total life upon others, is likely to be a greater burden than a help. And the person knowing not what to do, helping others to do it, only compounds the confusion. The blind lead the blind, and all fall into the ditch together. Therefore, the first duty of a leader is to make sure that his own eyes are open. And in order to have them open, whether it be in the simple leadership of home and family, or in the greater leadership of nation or race, the leader must have internal resources greater than his followers or he is not justified in leading them. And these resources must be good. They must be resources founded in virtue, guided by wisdom, moderated by reason and judgment, and given constant vitalization by the impulses of virtue and truth. When these things are present, then good results, and the individual finds his growth and his natural way of life constantly enriching. This of Pythagoras pointed out again that the Pythagorean way of life was not for everyone at any given moment. He could not cause the individual to come into those emergencies of life by which decision is necessary. He could only point out that once the individual has determined to improve himself, it can be accomplished. If, therefore, the individual, coming in his own due time to that maturity of insight, which makes him realize that improvement is necessary to survival, only that individual is ready for the philosophic life. 
And having made this dedication, he can then proceed as far as his own t integrity will sustain him. And he will go as far as his insight will sustain his determination to succeed. This was called the philosophic few, that group that had reached the point where it had suddenly realized that its trouble was due to itself. The world was then divided into two parts. The one, the larger part, being composed of persons who blame others. They are the unphilosophic material. Then there is the smaller group that recognizes self-responsibility for the consequences of conduct. This is the smaller group ready for greater insight. And those who had this insight could be led along that, the road of wisdom and could make that journey which leads finally back to our eternal home. The, reward, the rewards of discipline, then, are the gradual uh, integrations of the factors of living, so that at last we can sit down quietly and say to ourselves with full meaningfulness that we live in a good world, that we are surrounded by people who are essentially good, whose conduct that has long offended us is the result of the same circumstances that impelled our conduct which so long offended them. That we are all moved by the same non-tranquillities. And that by patience and growth we have grown. And that by patience and growth they will grow. We are there to help them. But only to help them to help themselves. For no man can grow for another. And no man can save another. But by example, we can invite others to the contemplative way of life. Having gradually reached this integration in ourselves, we come to the end of conflict. We are no longer bowed down by the opinions of others. We no longer cater to their weaknesses. We no longer subscribe to their superstitions. Rather, we live quietly respecting all things and serving mostly and with all our contrition of spirit that which is essentially true. Thus we come to what might be termed the fulfillment of the cathartic discipline of purification. We have removed impurity from ourselves. For all negative emotions, all uh, negative thoughts are impurities. All things which are not toward the good are away from the good. And that which is not for truth is against truth. And that which brings misery to ourselves and sorrow to others is not for the truth. Nor can we practice it with good grace, even though it be a dogma or doctrine of our time. We must be superior to these things where we find that dogmas and doctrines are man-made formulations around ideas essentially superior to these doctrines. And beyond all doctrine is the simple example of the good life lived by the great teacher who was the source of the doctrine. Having thus con concluded or consummated a reasonable attainment in the life of discrimination, the life of purification, the verses then tell us to direct our attention towards the sovereignties of those divine powers which are the rulers and leaders of the universe. From, not, from overcoming weakness, we then move to the growing of strength. From getting rid of that which is not so, we come to the cultivation of that which is so. In other words, we rise above the not-self the illusion in man, the egoism, egocentricity and selfishness, which have so long disfigured the human personality. And being freed of these lesser despots, having escaped from the tyranny and anarchy of self-will, the individual is ready to contemplate the mystery of the divine will. And all allegiances must be moved from that which is essentially human, 
to that which is essentially divine. Yet at the same time, we must know the divine through the human. But we must understand the human through the divine. They are conditions, degrees, and excellences of each other. And these we must contemplate with every means at our disposal. The, the being, the self in man, freed from slavery uh, or involvement in the hopeless confusion and complex of externalized existence, naturally turns its face like the sunflower to the source of its own light. It naturally and instinctively rejoices in good and moves toward the experience of identity with good. Is, is this goes along in its reasonable and proper manner, the human being finds moving from within himself the tremendous flowing of the divine will. He recognizes that to the degree that he is receptive, the divine becomes an, an imminent thing, filling all of his parts and members and causing him to become more and more like the source of good. And thus the individual, through the rise of his contemplative disciplines, moves into the true state of religion. And the true state of religion is companionship with God, comradeship with universals. The individual, having given up a false allegiance, must now make a true one. And in his true allegiance, he unites himself with that sovereign power which moves all things. He becomes aware more and more of divine consciousness because he has freed himself from the obscuration of mortal consciousness. He finds himself not only thinking about God, but with God. Not only experiencing uh, the fact of the divine, as a wonderful rationalized knowing, but also emotionally reacting to it, until finally it becomes the total being of himself. Thus the attainment of the better life leads toward this mystical experience, this illumination, uh, this final identification, which is the sovereignty of truth in the life of the person. Only after the disciplines, therefore, does man gain the power for the unconditioned veneration of the ultimate good. To venerate, we must to a degree understand. We cannot truly venerate that which is incomprehensible. Therefore, to recognize universal good, we must have some of goodness in ourselves. If we would recognize universal truth, we must have some of truthfulness in ourselves finding in the infinite the fulfillment and fullness of all virtues which we practice in part. But in time that which is in part shall pass away, and we shall know all things in fullness and in truth. So the Pythagorean verses go on to indicate the future state of these beings uh, which have uh, emancipated themselves. And of course, following the old Greek and also the Egyptian method, the philosophy ties into the mystery of death. Because death now becomes symbolical. Every time we forget the old, we die and are born into the new. The individual who gives up a grudge dies to be born a better person. For always death is the giving up of the old and birth is the attainment of the new. Therefore, every day that we grow, an old self dies, and a new self is born. Bondage lies in continuing in the same self, without freedom. If we never outgrow what we have been, we are bound to it forever. And this is inconceivable and impossible. Therefore, we are forever being reborn. And we are forever dying out of a lessness. And with every new experience, which is like the addition of a molecule or an electron to a formula, a totally new being comes into existence. Therefore, St. Paul says, I die daily. 
And out of this constant death of the old and the rebirth of the new, man is moving forward in consciousness. Every disillusionment, discouragement, despair, criticism and condemnation is another death. Every discovery of good is a new birth. Every hope that springs within us is a new birth in time. A birth of a new being dedicated to new purposes and new principles. There is an old self in each of us that must perish and a new self in each of us that must be liberated into manifestation. And this new self is a messianic self, a self which has within it the healing of all the old problems that burdened us. Every time we become bigger than a problem, we are reborn because we have attained freedom. We are in slavery to ignorance, but we are free men in the light of truth and of wisdom and of understanding. So in the death situation or symbolism comes the idea that through the death of the old, through the death of the lower being, man is liberated into the higher regions of true being. And the Pythagorean verses go on to point out that man having attained the philosophic death and the philosophic rebirth, the old self having died by discipline, the new self having been born by inspiration and aspiration. That this new being now transforms itself from a creature of the earth to a creature of heaven. It is like this fable of Cupid and Psyche. It is like the butterfly symbol which the Greeks used for the soul. The mortal being a caterpillar crawling upon the earth, then entering discipline or into a state of internal integration by building the cocoon and finally bursting forth as a winged creature, flying into the light. These are the states of man's soul. And it is the purpose of the golden verses to bring man to this radiant power of flight, to give him the wings of intuition and reason, that he may ascend out of the darkness of the underworld, straight to the light of truth. And these are not the wings of false learning fastened on by wax, which will melt off when we get too near the sun. These are our natural wings, hidden within ourselves, not put upon us from without. And these natural wings will sustain us, for we contain within our own nature this power of flight, this power of motion directly to the source of things. And it is so moved toward the source that man attains the end of the Pythagorean life. So the golden verses declare that at the end of man's search for reality, he shall himself truly become as the gods, knowing good and evil. He shall attain to communion with the eternal powers at the root of life. He shall join with them and serve with them. He shall be their instrument and they shall live through him. And through his own growth, Man keeps the faith with the gods and releases them. For a god is born every time the god in man is born. And all good things coming into birth through man bear witness to the eternal will of the everlasting good. Man becoming a servant of good becomes one with the gods. And having attained this, according to the Pythagorean verses, he enters into a state of felicity. He then comes no longer into the sorrow and darkness of the unknown, but he goes forth serving good as gloriously and as fully as he has previously served ignorance. Now if we look upon man at his present state and see how he wanders on year after year, generation after generation, age after age, reforming these same mistaken things, which have mutilated and distorted history since the beginning. We find that man has an almost inconceivable capacity to continue, to do things as they have been done, to continue the processes which have become natural and familiar to him. If, therefore, this man becomes enlightened, if he truly becomes one with the divine power, he may then subsist continuously in this, finding a way of life, 
as glorious, as happy, and as extensive as his more miserable existence is today. He will find then that all institutions which are necessary for his good will flourish, that his life and his world will be enriched, that peace will come to him, that the great enemies, sin and death, will disappear. If not literally, their power over him will vanish. For it is not death but the fear of death that slaves men to mortality. All things not good vanish away in the light of good. And it is perfectly possible and perfectly conceivable for men to live as well as they now live badly. That only, however, through the attainment of that which is true and necessary can this be done. Discrimination, then, gives man this picture. This picture of well-being, of rightness, of suitableness in all things and reminds him that he is human, that of all creatures that he knows, he has been most internally gifted, gifted with understanding, with insight, with skill, with faculties and powers, with memory and imagination, with sense and intuition, that he may accomplish all these things, that these wonderful faculties should be bound utterly to a narrow circle of materialistic activities is naturally unreasonable. Man with a tenth of the faculties could maintain himself as efficiently as the ant, whose culture and civilization, from a practical standpoint, is far greater than ours. But man has other purposes. He has other reasons for existence. And that he should have these powers and not recognize that they are invitations to growth seems incredible. That man should be able to look around him and see that he is greater than the animal, and yet have no desire to excel that animal in essential matters, is amazing and almost beyond conception. That we should see the great achievement of a few, that we should contemplate the wonderful attainments of those honored and venerated persons whom we regard as sanctified, and yet have no general impulse to emulate them, not to recognize that within ourselves is an open door leading to universal integration. Not to see this in the presence of the power to see it means that we have long been chained and held to false opinions. The Pythagoreans 2,600 years ago sought to bring these facts to man. That man, being obviously the noblest creature that we can perceive, must also have the noblest destiny. And that this destiny cannot be fulfilled in war and pillage and competition and strife. That these things do not lead to the end for which man is intended. They do not bring him into living communion with the gods. They do not restore him to his eternal estate. They do not liberate him from sin, ignorance, and fear. These things must be attained from within. A man endowed with the power to attain will attain if he makes the sincere and natural effort. But against this effort is the constant inertia, bounded by this eternal feeling that we can't do this and we can't do that. We simply lack this tremendous drive. Nature bestows impetus by giving us problem and showing us that we must either solve or be miserable. And in this emergency, with all our faculties and all our powers, man decides to be miserable. He still rejects solution, because this solution takes effort. And our civilization has gradually decreased our desire to use our resources for a purpose relating to our inner lives. Yet without this resource, so applied, our outer lives will never be solved. So the golden verses point to this future state in which man, joining with the gods in the infinite imperium, lives forever in beatitude, not necessarily actually meaning that he's going off into the sky and stay there, but meaning that he has found heaven within himself, that when he turns inward, he turns upon the countenance of the divine being, that when he is quiet out of the hidden springs and fountains of his own soul, 
flow waters of life instead of the polluted streams of his own perversions. That he can sit down and be at peace. That he can dream and hope that his faith is stronger than any doubt. And that in all decision, he decides with the gods. And having made this decisions, decision, finds that in all things, the divine power is with him. This being with the gods, being true to the rule, having the courage and insight and love to dedicate our powers and skills to that which is the greater good, this decision, this insight, brings with it the consolation of spirit that surpasseth understanding. In that time and under those conditions, all these dark things will pass away. We shall no longer see through a glass darkly, but face to face. And we shall also discover that in this seeing face to face, life becomes very simple. The philosophy becomes very simple. And that out of all learning comes only the strength to do that which is simple. To do those things which are true and then to live quietly in the constant light of the presence of truth. To make this attainment is our natural end and our natural birthright, and into the golden verses, therefore, have been incorporated what seems to me to be the essence, the substance, of the noblest thoughts of man. No great religion can deny these truths. It may attempt to develop them or specialize them, but still the principle remains that man, through the reformation and rededication of his life, through the offering of himself totally and without reservation, to the service of truth and upon the altar of good, by these dedications and these consecrations, man justifies the good life, justifies the presence of the gods, and that which, earn, that which he earns he shall have. And that which he serves shall come to him. And that which is his duty shall be shown to him. And he shall dwell in peace with the gods through all eternity. And he shall have, as the ancient said, his birthright in everlastingness. Time's up. <laughs> now, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Next week, we are going to uh, go in somewhat into the problem of Christian mysticism as it relates to man's instinctive search for reality. We're going to specialize and develop uh, somewhat the material of today, but there is now a new dimension added, and that is uh, the uh, a Christianized concept of the mystical experience as found in the writings of the early Christian fathers and uh, mystics of both the Catholic and Protestant denominations, and the subject will be The Dark Night of the Soul, taken from the title of a mystical book. But I think you will find it a rather worthwhile and stimulating line of thought. Now, on Wednesday evening, we're beginning a series of uh, courses at headquarters. I'm taking a series on astral theology or the effect of the belief in the heavens, the heavenly bodies, and the motions of stars upon the development of man's religious life. Now, a great many people today are worried about uh, Asiatic influenza. How many people know the meaning of the word influenza? It means, literally, bad influence from the stars. That's how the word came into existence. So if you have influenza, you have a bad star somewhere. <laughs> or if you have a disaster, you have an unfavorable star. Dis and aster, an evil star. So these terms, which even in our language have come to us, may remind us that philosophy is deeply involved in these problems. I'd like to also call to your attention that we have articles on the Pythagorean system of philosophy, in some of our publications, we have a section on it in our book, Journey in Truth, which deals heavily with the Greek classical wisdom. We also have an article on the Pythagorean system of numbers in our book, The Phoenix, and uh, also extensive article 
on Pythagoras in our symbolical philosophy book, the large volume that we have had reprinted in photographic process. So therefore, you can have material about this school and its teaching from our publication. Let me also call attention to our Christmas booklets, which we hope you will find useful as Christmas cards. If you do some of your Christmas shopping with us, it will, we think, make more meaning in many instances to your gifts, also simplify your problems, and provide you with the consolation and understanding that sometimes ideas are better than things as gifts. And perhaps we need the gifts of ideas and ideals more than other things at this particular time. I'd like to also invite your consideration to the counseling service offered by the Society. A number of persons are taking advantage of it, not to get out of trouble, but to keep out of trouble. And if uh, anyone has any interest in that subject, there is a leaflet on the table explaining this service. If you are not on our mailing list, we'd be happy to have your names and addresses, and we hope you will visit our book table. We thank you for being with us, and hope to see you next week.